Okay, we are now recording. All right, welcome everyone. Um, we have an exciting meeting ahead of us here. We've got almost a full house of folks. Um, I our our family has nearly two years to the day managed to finally get the COVID. So my oh. son, <laughs> oh. Oh. my son tested positive this morning. He's feeling fine. I mean, he's feeling a little sick, but fine. So him and his sister have been watching screens literally all day long. So <laughs> they will might break in. We just don't know what's going to happen. Um, so just throwing that out there to start. Um, Welcome Stella and Anna, and we will definitely go through introductions in a minute, but first we're going to review and vote on minutes. So since you all weren't in our previous meeting, you can abstain, or Anna, you wouldn't vote, but Stella, you can just abstain from, from this. Um, we're trying a new process where we look at the minutes in advance, so we don't have to spend time during the meeting scrolling through them. Um, just for your information for, for next time. Um, so with that, for the members that were here last time, I'll open it up for anybody that has any edits or suggestions to the minutes. Otherwise we can, um, someone can motion to accept them. I have one uh, proposed correction under um, section 4.0 EC member updates. Anna's last name is misspelled. Yeah. Oh. In the first occurrence, it's not at, in the last sentence of that paragraph. That's it. Find a new liaison. <laughs> <laughs> I will correct that. <laughs> to put it in your spell checker, too. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm happy to, to um, move that we accept the minutes. I'll second that motion. Okay, great. And then actually I should probably decide, we should figure out who's next in the list here to take notes. Hey, Laura, I actually I put, put it in the order of uh, oh, people right. taking the minutes, so. Ah. Okay, so Vasu just took them. So it looks like Don, you're next in line. Is that okay? Oh. Sure. Um, so Laura, I have to take a vote on the minutes. Yes. So we're going to do a voice vote. Um, so either yes, no, or abstain. So Rose? Yes. Roof? Yes. Breger? Yes. Allison? Yes. Selman? Abstain. Uh, Raghavan? Other than screwing up Anna's name, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Drucker? Yes. And D. Abstain. Right. So the minutes are approved. Great. Um, so let's see here. Should we do public comment first and then do introductions? And just see if there's anybody in the public here. Yes, we have three attendees. Okay. Um, so we typically do public comment at the beginning and end of our meetings. Um, so if anyone would like to make a comment now, please raise your hands and we'll give you uh, around three minutes. Otherwise there will be another opportunity, opportunity later. Of course, you're also just welcome to listen in. Okay, seeing no hands being raised, I will move on to new member introductions. So as Stephanie mentioned um, or emailed us earlier this week, we have two new members of ECAC and one new counselor liaison, which is very exciting. Um, Lori could not join today. She sends her regards. She had a previously scheduled doctor's appointment and um, considering I just had to reschedule the kids 
dentist appointments for tomorrow and I couldn't get in until August. <laughs> I am imagining she did not want to reschedule. Um, but she sends her regards and she'll be here next time. Um, but I would love to give Stella an opportunity to introduce herself to the group, um, as well as Anna, and then maybe we can all go around quickly and just give our names and one fun fact about ourselves, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Stella D. Um, I'm a current PhD student in arbor culture at UMass studying pruning. I've been a practicing commercial arborist for the last five years or so, and also doing some inventory arbor culture on the ALB project. I have a master's in forestry, and my undergrad was in archaeology, where I did a lot of community gardening and stuff. I'm also the mother of a two-year-old. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and I would say my primary interest is in, is in plants and, and vegetation and how that can contribute to climate change mitigation and um, decreased energy use, both in their their management practices and their placement and selection. Am I up, Laura? All right. So hi, everybody. I'm Anna. Um, so it's Anna, not Anna, like the Disney princess is my go to if you are if that's a helpful reference. Um, I'm a town councilor representing District 5 South Amherst and I will be your counselor liaison. Um, so what that means, just for a point of reference, because I know this, I will be ECAC's first liaison, which is very exciting. I do not vote. Um, technically in the rules, this is a little odd. I don't even have to be at your meetings. Um, I plan on being at your meetings, just to be clear. Um, but I do, and I told Stephanie this, I do have to uh, typically duck out a little early from them, but I will always go back and watch the recording from the time that I do have to miss. Um, and my, my job is to kind of carry forward um, and support the initiatives that you want to take on that are appropriate at a council level. So I think whereas like Stephanie has all of the um, the like executive components of it on lock, I can help with the legislative components. So that's where I think um, hopefully I can come in and support you all there. Uh, and then also keeping you up to date on what the council's working on that might benefit from a climate uh, sustainability lens. Fun facts about me, um, I've been in meetings since, <laughs> since 8 a.m. today, so I'm a little fried, I apologize. Um, I did, I, I sort of grew up in Amherst. I went to Amherst High School. Um, I actually grew up in New Salem, but um, that's not that fun. I mean, it's super fun, but it's not that fun. Um, my fun fact is that I uh, am learning how to fly powered paragliders, which is probably not super climate friendly because they are gas powered, but when they come out with a solar one, I'm all on it. <laughs> or lightweight batteries. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Need those ultralight batteries. So that's that's me. Oh, and um, email me. I uh, My email is publicly available. It's my last name, which is long and complicated, I know. But um, and my first initial at AmherstMA.gov. Feel free to reach out. Super excited to be here. Great. Thanks, Anna. Um, just very quickly, Laura Drocker, chair of ECAC. I, I used to work at Amherst College as the director of sustainability. Now I work for a group called Ceres, which is based in Boston and focuses on using investor pressure and policy pressure to drive action on climate change and water issues and, and a few other things. Um, my fun fact is that we just got a heat pump two weeks ago. It's very exciting. And it's working great, even with the snow. OK. Uh, Jesse, let's popcorn. Popcorn. I don't know what that means, but um, I, my name is Jesse Selman. I'm part of the ECAC. I'm a local architect in town. I've got two kids here in Amherst. Um, in a little sort of oversized backyard or undersized farm. And my fun fact is I just ordered, I think all the wires and parts I need to turn my electric lawnmower into backup power for my house. <laughs> and if I'm not at the next meeting, it's because I electrocuted myself. <laughs> 
I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, popcorn means you pick the next person. Uh, Dwayne B. That's that's me, uh, Dwayne Breger here. Uh, hi, Stella and Anna. Welcome to our uh, group, and really um, great to have you. Uh, we really uh, appreciate uh, a larger group and, and new new um, new new blood in in, in our uh, in our thinking. So um, great to have you. I'm also at at, at UMass. Uh, Stella, I'm um, uh, the director of the Clean Energy Extension at the university, uh, which is in the um, extension programs, but I'm also affiliated with the Environmental Conservation Department. Um, I, and I say, I'll say hi to Chad because I knew Chad from my previous job. Yeah, uh, good to see you, Duane. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Um, at, when I was at uh, the Department of Energy Resources for 13 years, um, about six years ago. Uh, I guess my fun facts, I got two adult kids have been through the uh, Amherst uh, school systems, school system. Um, my, my, my younger son, who, who's a full-fledged professional now, he works uh, in town hall as a, as a new, new planner. Uh, so Anna, you might um, cross paths with him. Um, ben is his name. Uh, and my other son, my older son, he, he's, he's got us a grandchild. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, two years into being a grand, granddad and can't get enough of it. <laughs> and I will uh, pick uh, Vasu. All right, hi everyone. Welcome to the uh, ECAC. Uh, great to have you all here. Um, my name is Vasu Raghavan. I, Lead value engineering for Medtronic. It's a medical device company, 90,000 employees. So I'm uh, I lead two of the five networks. So a pretty large portion of uh, the value engineering. What that means is we, we go to different manufacturing sites. We have 67 manufacturing sites, 20 sites under my umbrella, but we don't go to different manufacturing sites. We get to take products apart. We take, get to take our competitor products apart. And we try to find ways to solve and reduce cost and improve value to our customer. Um, so that happens during non-COVID time when I get to travel to different places. And I do love to travel as a fun fact. Um, but another fun fact is I, I play tennis. Um, I used to be the top three um, juniors in my country. And I come from India. Um, and yeah, I've moved to the States 15 years ago. But yeah, that was a long time ago. Um, but I still play tennis. I, I used to teach. A little bit uh, to some of the uh, college kids at uh, Amherst College. And I picked Steve Roof. <laughs> the odds were getting getting short for me. Um, hi, hi Stella, hi Anna. We've talked. Um, I have been around in town for quite a few years now. Uh, been a professor at Hampshire College since 1995. And before that, I was doing my dissertation up at UMass. I do climate change research. I've been doing that for 35 years now. And my work for the last 10 or 20 years has been largely up in the Arctic, um, where I've had a chance to study the, the rapid climate change that's occurring up there. And it's um, been a wonderful experience. It's also been somewhat sad to, to, to see that over that, that, the amount of change over that time span. Um, I've also been getting into uh, renewable energy, researching that and teaching that with students at Hampshire College and uh, monitoring some of the, the, the solar panels and systems that we have at, at the college. I find that quite fascinating. Um, fun fact, I guess I'd mentioned that I have a wood stove, a regular wood stove here that I have automated. So it uh, controls the throttle by itself. It keeps the temperature in the room nice and steady, and it makes a gong sound whenever we need to go and stick some more wood in it. And let's see who's left. Andra, I think you are um, up for intro. Hi, I am Andra Rose. Um, I've been in Amherst since 2002 raised two kids here and um, great to fun fact, my oldest um, and his wife who also grew up around here, uh, settled in Montague and are expecting in June. 
So every time anybody asks me any, what I'm looking forward to, even if they mean in the next week, <laughs> it's like June, <laughs> grandma. So um, I am um, one of the leaders locally and at the state level of Mothers Out Front, and um, particularly work on the legislative um, work we do at, um, at the state level. Um, and also was one of the folks instrumental in getting Amherst, Northampton and Pelham um, working together to do a joint municipal aggregation, which is gonna happen, yeah. <laughs> getting closer every day. So, um, and uh, the, the residents group that, that did start that um, is now called Local Energy Advocates of Western Math. And we got this really exciting um, event happening next Wednesday, Tuesday, yeah, Tuesday 15th at seven to hear from um, Ithaca about how they're gonna decarbonize 6,000 of their buildings, which is all of them, in, by 2030. <laughs> so um, let's see, um, who else on the committee? Don, did you go yet? I did not. Yeah, okay, yours. I've been taking notes furiously. Um, hi, uh, Stella and Anna. Um, my name is Don Allison. Um, I'm a lawyer. Um, my wife and I moved up here to Amherst in 1988 from Washington, D.C. I had spent eight years at the United States Attorney's Office as an assistant United States attorney in, in Washington. Um, before that, I had worked for a large, very large law firm in, in Boston, two most miserable years of my life, I might add. Um, I have four kids. Um, and they all went to Amherst Regional High School. And Anna, I wouldn't surprised, be surprised if one or more of them weren't there when you were there. Um, uh, actually, the fun fact about me is my, my four kids try to take me on adventures. And I turned 70 uh, in, in, on March 25th. And so I won't be at our next meeting um, because my four grown children are taking me on a 100-mile hike in the Scottish Highlands on the West Highland Way. Um, so uh, you may know either Caroline Barrett, James, or Ben Allison. I don't know when you finished up at, at Amherst Regional, um, but they were 04, 05, 07, and 09. Um, I was 08. What? I was 08, so right in the middle. Ah, well, they were- The name sounds familiar though. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's my fun fact. So. I have, I have nothing to report except I'm a lawyer. That's whatever that means or doesn't mean. I think I'm the last one, so. Oh, Laura, yeah. Laura, there's uh, you. Yeah. There's me, I did go. I don't know, Stephanie, I think you know Anna and Stella, but I don't know if there's any, do you share? I think you should still have to share a fun fact and then we can get on with the agenda. <laughs> I would be more than happy. Well, besides the fact that I've worked for the town since 1997, um, so it's been a long time. Officially, I'm really have only been here since 2000, but really I started in 97. Um, but my fun fact is that um, I sing with a band. <laughs> yeah. That's my fun fact. What type of music? Well, do I you actually think you want us to guess what type of music? <laughs> yeah, just guess. Yeah, actually, that would be kind of fun. <laughs> Um, no, I actually sing with, well, two groups. One is a really big um, area chorus, and they have groups all over, which is called Rock Voices. And I sing with them. I sing with the Northampton group, um, or sometimes the Brattleboro group. Uh, but I also actually am in a small band. And we, what do we do? We're kind of um, an acoustic group that does, sometimes we do like Celtic Irish Scots kind of stuff but we also do um you know we just do kind of more mellow rock sometimes but we'll also throw in some like 80s alternative because that's what I love 
So uh, we're, we're kind of all over the map, but we have a stand-up bass player, two guitarists. Um, we did have a fiddle player, but she's been really busy with family stuff. Um, I sometimes play the Bodron Irish Celtic drum. And um, what else uh, is fun about our band? Oh, oh yeah. the, the most interesting and fun fact is that we have a, a flute player who sometimes joins us, uh, who is Katie Coleman, the astronaut. Whoa. <laughs> so we have fun. <laughs> I wonder if you can play the flute in the uh, in the uh, international in the in space. She did. She actually yeah, okay. did. That yeah. was recorded, it, and you could yeah. look it up. Um, she, I think, she played with. Uh, I think it was. Um, oh damn! The chieftains were on stage, and they somehow satellite linked her while she was on the space station playing her flute. Stephanie, I'm not frantically googling this or anything but what was the name of your band <laughs> oh it, it won't you won't find much uh because we we're really still we've hardly played out much but uh we're called crowd the plow p-l-o-u-g-h <laughs> nice it, it's going to be an agenda item at the retreat right <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah sure. we'll all be <laughs> Laura, can i just say one really quick thing so sorry so sure. just I don't want folks to think I am ignoring you, but for most of these meetings, I am not to participate unless you ask me to. So I will have my video on and sound off. So because otherwise I'm really inclined, as you can see, to jump in. So I'm going to limit it and unless you ask me, uh, I will be here, but video off and, and muted. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, Anna. Um, okay, so I know that, that this has been enthralling for Eddie and Chad. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and move them up ahead of staff and ECAC updates so that you all can get on with your evening. Um, and then we'll go back to the agenda if that's okay with everybody. So Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you to kick that off. Okay, well, I think Eddie and um, Chad really can sort of summarize, but they're working, they're, they're from Cadmus Group and working with us um, on the Metagrant funded project, which is uh, solar feasibility and analysis of uh, specific sites in town. So I'll let them say more. I um, just want to thank them both for their willingness to, to join us and share the information uh, with, with the ECAC and, and, and also to give you an opportunity to, to sort of um, weigh in if you have comments, concerns, questions, whatever, this is a great opportunity to, to share those with these guys. So Eddie and Chad, whichever one of you want to jump in and share your screens and take over. Great. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. I think I'll, I'll do the honors here. So let me know when you're able to see this. Should be some slides here. Well, well Eddie's pulling that up. Just a quick, um, uh, quick background on Cadmus. We're a sustainability an energy consulting firm have offices in Boston and Waltham, but also 18 other offices around the country and also in uh, in Germany um, and help a lot of different clients, um, broadly speaking, with decarbonization, climate resilience uh, initiatives from local governments all the way up to national governments, utilities, and then international development banks um, helping developing countries uh, and other international clients. Um, transition to renewables and, and become more resilient. Um, and Laura, I've worked closely with Dan Bacall at Ceres uh, about 20 years ago. He and I were both at Rocky Mountain Institute at the same time um, and we have worked closely with Duane. Uh, I think we published a paper together on a system dynamics model of yeah. the of the SREC market in Massachusetts yeah. back in like 2011. <laughs> so uh, you've, you've assembled a great group and, and we're excited to be working with uh, Amherst uh, on, on this project, um, we support a number of municipalities across the Northeast, helping them navigate solar potential and then procurement. Uh, so yeah, with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to Eddie. Thanks, Chad. Yeah, and one other quick note, Dwayne, my fun fact, I'm in the offshore wind certificate program at UMass. Oh, awesome. I've seen your, your name tossed around. It's been great so far, awesome. yeah. Oh, so, that's great, great to hear. Yeah. Awesome. Um, but yeah, anyway, so we can dive in. I think my colleague Katie uh, presented these slides uh, maybe two weeks ago to Stephanie and maybe a few others. So apologies if, if some of you have already seen these before, but uh, we wanted to give the, the overview to, to the whole team here. Um, and just to make sure my screens are 
Or my screen is viewable here. Can everyone see? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so agenda, we're just going to go through the um, team structure, quick Cadmus uh, slide, and an overview of our tasks and the approach, um, data collection, next steps, and the overall uh, project timeline. Um, so uh, I added this to these slides we'd sent out earlier. Um, but yeah, just quick overview on Cadmus as a firm. Uh, I think Chad summed us up pretty well. I'm on the distributed energy resources team. Chad is on the sustainability and energy team. Um, you know, so we, we've helped uh, a wide range of clients. Um, we, we work a lot in Massachusetts with Mass Massachusetts municipalities. Um, so uh, we feel feel pretty qualified to, to help you out with this, this task here. Um, overall team structure, uh, Chad will be overseeing the project as the principal investigator. Um, I'll be providing support and my colleague, Katie Harrison will be the main point of contact. She wasn't able to join today um, and also supported by our other colleague, Erica Blevins. Uh, and then moving into the tasks and approach. Um, so we have four tasks. Um, kickoff meeting, which is, you know, something kind of this and what we had already had. Um, then diving into the uh, individual site assessments, um, looking at the solar, so apologies for the acronyms here for folks who don't know, PV, photovoltaic solar, ESS, energy storage systems. Um, so looking at solar and energy storage financial modeling for that third task and then tying it all together in the final task, the feasibility memo, which summarizes our um, findings. Um, so approach baseline electricity uh, or energy usage data here, um, looking at solar potential. Uh, so how much solar could you know fit on site, whether it be rooftop or solar canopy? Um, looking at optimizing the energy storage sizing um, based on some of the electricity usage on site, um, as well as identifying additional benefits of storage. Looking at uh, the resilience capabilities for um, you know grid outages, uh, as well as some. Um, you know, higher like utility level demand response programs or the ISO New England independent system operator of, of New England's um, demand response and forward capacity market uh, potentials as well. Uh, and then we have the outcomes here, kind of just summarizing what I just said with, um, you know, highlighting project uh, costs, um, overall economic returns, financing options, um, and yeah, some, some planning timelines. And next steps, looking at the sites here that are to be included in the analysis, whether or not we're looking at the roof or the, or also the parking canopy um, as potential um, for hosting solar. And you can see the asterisk at the bottom that we are looking at energy storage across these sites as well. And then I added this graphic, which is just a uh, an example of you know some of the analysis that we can do depending on the uh, level of granularity of, of data. Um, so this is like a representative um, picture of electricity usage across a few days at a sample building. So in the top left here, you have just the base uh, standard building um, electricity use profile over a few days. So you can see kind of in the middle of the day, electricity peaks, you know, as you know, folks arrive at work and everything's operating, maybe there's AC or lots of lights on, um, kind of dips through the end of the day and it's, kind of, and it's a recurring period here. So as we're looking at three, three days or so. So this is our base case. And then you look at what energy storage by itself could do to the typical electricity usage. Um, so you can see compared to the, the base case, the maximum electricity usage is capped here. Um, so this is when the storage would be dispatched uh, and this is a way of saving 
um, money on the electricity bill since the the demand charge is you know can be can be quite high on your electricity bill. Um, so this is you know what storage itself could do, and then down here in the bottom left, what solar itself could do to the profile. So you can see um, it still increases pretty high, but then as you know, assuming we're in the middle of the day here, the solar production starts to offset pretty significantly um, the usage on site. And then of course, uh, you know, sunsets and solars not producing energy anymore. So then you would see an increase um, or you, you, you know, there wouldn't be any offset. So you'd have the normal business as usual energy. Um, and then on the far right here, you see the, the benefits of having both energy storage to limit the peaks of, of usage and then the solar production to help offset uh, electricity on site throughout the day. Um, so that's just like an example, you know, depending on the granularity of, of usage data that we get of the, the type of analysis that we can do for, for saving um, energy and money. Uh, and then wrapping up here with uh, just the, our proposed timeline. Uh, uh, by task, uh, you can see kind of in the middle of, of data collection here in March, uh, and then uh, site analysis as well. Um, then we start to look into feasibility throughout the rest of the month and into April, uh, as well as storage modeling, and then kind of you know tie everything together uh, for the feasibility memo. Um, so we have version one uh, set to be submitted by the end of May. So the Amherst team can review it and provide comments. And then we can address those comments in the finalized version two in uh, mid-June is what we have here as our target date. Uh, so then we just have some next steps on what we are uh, going to be diving into, um, you know, the days and weeks to follow. Um, still working through, you know, like what are the top goals for energy storage for the for Amherst, whether it be resilience, uh, you know, cost savings, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm not sure if we wanted to have that uh, discussion here or just wanted to uh, kind of voice that that's what we are actively considering. Uh, and I think with that, yeah, that, that was all we had. So I can open up the, the floor to any questions or comments. Jesse, I see your, your hand is raised. Yeah, if, am I understanding this correctly that you are, as far as your baseline analysis, you are only looking at existing electrical loads and not, or will you also be considering um, gas and oil, uh, the, 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 the probably much larger fossil fuel loads and to what that would look like as far as if those technologies transition to electrical, being able to predict that. Mm -hmm. So the, I, I can take that one, Eddie. So the, sure. I mean, the initial scope is look at the existing data for the existing buildings and say, what would happen if you put solar and solar and storage on those? We, we, did, we weren't tasked with modeling out what would those buildings if, look like or what that load would look like if they were electrified. Um, but if if there is a particular building and you do have that data available, we certainly can can model that. Um, but we didn't we didn't have in our scope of work sort of hypothetically looking at a building and and then analyzing what we think it would take to electrify heating uh, at that building. But if you have already done that analysis and you know what that load might look like and you want to feed us that data, we could certainly take that into account. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Uh, Dwayne, I see your hand is also up. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, and, and something that may be affiliated with Jesse's question, and that is on some of these sites, um, not that I know the data yet <laughs> that, that you guys are digging into, but it may there may be the potential to have well more solar than what the demand of the building is or the load of the building is. I'm thinking particularly with the parking canopies, but even you know, like at Cherry Hill Golf Course, there's <clears throat> not, you know, <laughs> not a whole lot of demand there. Um, uh, and I'm wondering whether, um, would you also be looking at not just matching the, the solar with the load on the building there, but in terms of the maximum potential solar that could be built out and then potentially um, 
net meter uh, uh, to other other uh, um, meters on uh, of the town. Yeah, um, I so I think we would be looking at yeah probably like two scenarios. So one would be maximum solar build out, and then one other one being sizing it to the town. And then with the maximum solar build out, you're right. There's likely going to be definitely some cases where there's excess solar production relative to on-site demand. Um, so we can look at um, you know the the system as a whole and whether that could be or those credits could be virtually net metered to other uh, town owned facilities. Um, and then keeping in mind the, I think there's uh, the, the 10 megawatt cap for, for net metering. Um, so we'd definitely be cognizant of that as well for the town. Um, but yeah, I think that, that makes sense and is definitely an easy and beneficial uh, task. Or yeah. And, and, and from a policy perspective, it makes sense to, maximize as much solar as you can possibly put it and the the policies in massachusetts are favorable to allow that because then you can you know put that excess to a different account um, so that that's why we would do the two the two scenarios but if you if you tell us otherwise for a particular site um right like let us let us know but those are that's that's where we're starting from I think uh, steve so sorry eddie yeah. yeah thanks i was gonna call on steve as well Go ahead. Okay, um, I had the same same basic question that Dwayne just asked, but um, a subsequent question then is, are you examining the finances of any of these systems or the financial models that the town could choose among for supporting um, these kinds of solar developments, you know, power purchase agreements or, or own outright or loans, those sort of things. Yep, so what we typically do is we'll have like two ownership scenarios. One would be the third party owned power purchase agreement. Um, it's tough for us to say exactly what that would be as you know, it can vary significantly by developer. Um, but we have some, you know, internal, uh, like, S, like, I, I think we can, we can somewhat accurately predict what a PPA range or power purchase agreement range would look like, based on market trends and, um, you know, just ec economic returns and whatnot. Um, so we'll we'll like estimate what we think a peep, uh, you know, a, a realistic PPA would be, um, and then compare, you know, like the if it's solar, like a twenty-five year savings of that versus whether the, the town were to own it outright, and then we would want to look at any available loans or you know the, the town's like bond rate to try and. Um, yeah, capture that uh, so to, to paint like a realistic comparison of the 25 year um, savings by scenario. That's great, good. Um, I have a second question and that is when I was involved at Hampshire College of, of getting quotes for the uh, 20 acre system that we have there, the companies that submitted quotes did a fair bit of the kind of work that it seems like you're doing here so with the work that you're doing, will that be a package that the town could then use when to, and then give to companies that are potentially interested in developing so that it would sort of shortcut, they wouldn't have to repeat some of the analyses that you're doing? Yeah, it definitely could. And we've done that um, in the past for, for other municipalities. Um, you know, it's really up to, to you all. Sometimes, um, you know, maybe our estimates are a little bit more conservative or, you know, vice versa, their estimates are a little too optimistic. So we'll defer to, you know, what, what you all think is, is, is best. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely an option. Um, and, and we've also seen clients, yeah, put out our estimates and say that these are, you know, what the independent third party came up with. You can use these or you can, you know, produce your own if you'd like for, for the RFP response. Um, Chad, do you have anything to add on that? I know you've probably had more experience there. Yeah, I would just said it, it can also just help inform once you put the projects out to bid and, and develop a request for proposals, um, which of these you may or may not want to include. So rather than just saying, here are all the sites and letting the developers choose, you might say, here's some analysis we did. We're, we'd like to prioritize these five sites. These are others that seem marginal. marginal tell us what you think, or our analysis might point to say like, you know, two of these 
may not, may not be worth it, or a, you know, it would be a very small system. We storage might not work at this location. Something to that effect to help you at least just sort of fine tune in the request for proposals what exactly you're asking the developers to to do and which sites you want them to focus on. Did you put the slide up that shows the uh, locations that you're considering or evaluating? Yep. Let me find that. This one right yeah. here, right? Okay. Right. Is our is your evaluation considering the uh, electrical grid uh, connection capability of those sites? Uh, yeah. So I, I think what we would do is we would look at um, the utilities have those. Uh, if you're familiar, like hosting capacity maps, which detail the infrastructure, and yeah, we would include that as you know, like. I don't, I don't know how um, like current those typically are, but they give you, you know, the best picture you're going to have is to, oh, you know, this, you could interconnect this, no problem, or, you know, this all looks great, but you're going to need to pay a lot of money to upgrade the um, yeah, distribution system that it would interconnect to. We would, yeah, we would flag, um, you know, we, we would incorporate that into the, the feasibility. You know, this one looks good, ready to go per our read of the, the grid and yeah, highlight where that might be an issue. So that's a, yeah, a good, good point. Great, good, that, that'll be really helpful. And then, and then as a next step is that after our analysis is done, you could do a pre-interconnection pre application to the utility prior to putting out an RFP for maybe a couple of sites you might have a question and you get sort of a, I mean, the utility doesn't really commit to anything at that point. Um, but they might give you some sense of where their where where their thinking is. Um, but then the the full interconnection applications and all of that that would be on the developer to pay for that and do that as part of their bid for uh, when they're responding to the RFP. Great, thank you. Andrew, I see you're raising your hand as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. Um would wonder if you are going to look um, at the potential for um, the like uh, connective possibilities for uh, either charging stations um, in solar parking um, parking canopies um, or the um yeah and 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 then also the charger to building storage options um, that, that was question. not within the scope of our analysis um so that could be like either a follow-on a follow-on project uh, or it is the type of thing that you could ask a developer to propose in a request for proposals. So if for those locations where we find that a canopy project might make a lot of sense, you could put in the RFP that you would like the developer to also pro to propose two different options um, when they are putting together their bid, one for uh, a canopy with, uh, with and without uh, EV, EV charging infrastructure. Um, but we, we are not <clears throat> doing that level of analysis uh, for, this, for this scope. Okay, and anything um, with microgrids? Nope. Um, we'll, we'll identify the storage capabilities at the sites, and then you'll tell us if, if the primary usage for that storage, if you'd like it to be it, with, with storage, the question is, do you want the battery to primarily be sitting there and charged in case of an emergency, or do you want it interacting with the grid to reduce demand charges and, and generate some form of revenue, either in capacity markets or the other programs that are available for incentives from the, the state and the utilities? Um, but we, we're not exploring here the idea of um, creating an interconnected set of buildings that can disconnect from the electric grid or reconnect. So we're not really looking at any microgrid capabilities. Um, so that could be a sort of a future scope of work 
um, or, 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 or future analysis once you have these systems in place and you think, okay, these are, these are some systems where solar and storage make sense. Um, maybe they're close enough to each other that you might want to create a microgrid between some of these buildings. Um, that could be, again, um, additional analysis down, down the road or something that you might ask developers to, to propose. Um, but we're not we're not doing a a, a micro grid analysis here for this for this scope initial scope. Vasu, did you have your hand up at one point? Yeah, I, I did, and I had a same question as Andra, but I just thought uh, okay. of another one. Um, <laughs> and and this maybe is a question for Stephanie. So when we do the much uh, the larger study, will these be out of scope? Basu, I'm sorry. What was the last part of that? So will these sites on this list will that be out of scope? Uh, they'll be. Yeah, I think what will. I mean, we'll have to wait until we get there, <laughs> but. Um, you know, certainly that's going to be town wide and what we might be able to do is maybe do a little bit of a deeper dive on some of these that are already being assessed as part of this analysis. Certainly whatever consultant we hire to do the assessment will be provided with the information from this report. So we may take a deeper dive. And I just wanted to say in response to Andrew's question um, and the level of analysis that we have going there. This was a grant funded project and it was very limited funds. We only had $15,000 maximum for this study. So um, it wasn't it wasn't a lot. Yeah, Stephanie, the, my, my question was also around, uh, you know, because we have the solar working group that's being formed, this information will also have to feed into that if it's going to remain out of scope for the larger study. Right. That's what I'm saying is it won't, right. It won't be out of scope. It'll be feeding into that. That's yeah, what I'm saying okay. is this information will be part, this information will be presented with the previous studies that have been done to the, whatever consultant we go with. And some of that, that's all, a lot of that is to be determined exactly what that scope will look like. We're not, we're not there. We're not having that conversation yet. Okay. Thank you. I see, Dwayne, you have your hand up again. Was that a legacy hand or did you re-raise it? Uh, no, I do, but I, I think Steve was, was first. So. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, sure. Steve, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I was just trying to remember. Uh, I think Steffi and I <clears throat> attended a, a webinar by Eversource back in November, and they were promoting utility-owned solar programs, which... I don't remember, was that cited? That was cited on company land within the municipality. Okay, that's not exactly what I was thinking of. I have heard of programs, and I can't remember the name now, where the community government, the local government, and the and the and the solar developers oh, what co-own or co-operate a solar site. And there are some benefits, I believe, in the SMART program that help facilitate the approvals and developments. Um, the, the, are you aware of what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe Dwayne does. And if so, would these sites that might be rooftops and parking lot canopies, would they qualify for that kind of a um, arrangement? I'm, I'm not sure I tracked the co the co-ownership model. That between the developer and the municipality, um, that one's not that one's not ringing a, a bell for me. Is it, are you thinking of a like a community having the project be a community solar project that's hosted on the government on on the town website, but that participants from the town are subscribers to the project? Or that, that wasn't what I was thinking about, but that could be an interesting model to yep. to. Explore as an option, but I think I bet you Dwayne knows what I'm talking about. Well, I'm not sure if I do, but I, I do. I do understand there's a because this this has come up in in Shutesbury with regard to much 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 larger projects. Uh, but I think there there's an uh, 
and you know, I left the OER a while ago and I can't say <laughs> I'm an expert on the SMART program, but, um, uh, but I believe there's an adder in the SMART program for projects that, that demonstrate that they are, are uh, municipally owned or um, operated. Um, uh, and I'm not sure if I have the terminology quite right yet, yet there, but to the extent that, you know, even if the town doesn't own it, but they take a role in the operation of it, then this adder can apply. Uh, and I'm uh, not sure, okay. I'm not sure, yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure if that applies only to larger projects, but, um, but it might be, it, maybe that's what Steve is uh, referring to. Yes, yes, thanks. That's what I got was it. Okay, we'll, we'll dig. Our analysis will include all the different smart um, iterations, smart program iterations to try and maximize. So we'll, we'll make sure and include that as, a, as one, if it, again, once I don't have the details of that particular adder off the top of my head either, um, but we'll, we'll make sure that we look at that one. And, and as, as we typically do in terms of what are all the adders and how many can you possibly uh, uh, qualify for, for any given project, given some of the size limitations and location limitations. So we'll, we'll definitely take a look at that. Great. I'm just going to jump in for a second here and um, try to move us along on the agenda. This has been really helpful. Thank you for this update. Um, Andra, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to make one last question or point? Um, yeah, I was wondering if you'll be looking at any um, ground mounted solar on um, some of the properties that have more space. I don't um, know that our initial, oh, go ahead, Eddie. Yeah, I'm not sure either if that is within this scope. This this was our initial like list that we got, but so if there if there is a ground mounted possibility at one of these locations, like let us know. I mean, we certainly can throw that into the analysis, um, but a, the initial ask was roof and parking and some of these, had it was already described that roof was sort of off the table or parking canopy was off the table but if there is ground it's less common to find um large open space that it, folks want to put solar on um within like the municipal owned buildings or nearby but if there is a site that you feel like is good for that let us know that might be something more appropriate for the next um Townwide assessment. I think this one was very, like I said, this was very limited in the scope that we had to work with because of the funding. And tar yeah, and targeted to just a few locations. Like, I, yeah, we, do, we don't want to misrepresent that these are like the only places that solar could work. That's not, that's not what, where this list came from. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, this is going to be a really helpful. Um, piece of the puzzle. So thank you, um, Stephanie, for getting the grant and Chad and Eddie for coming, giving us this presentation. I don't know, Stephanie, if you wanna, I guess if folks have other, think of other things after this meeting, feel free to send them on to Stephanie and she can pass them along. Um, I don't know, Stephanie, if you have anything to, else to close out on this in terms of timeline or next steps. Uh, no, I think, um... As they pointed out at the end of May um, will be the the final draft for review and um, I could certainly before it gets to that final draft in May maybe bring one of the the drafts for all for all of you to take a look at as we move the process along um, so I could maybe give you an earlier draft before that final May draft and then um, we would certainly want you to weigh in on that end of May draft before the final June draft. Okay, great. Um, yeah, Jesse. Just, just a quick question. I just wanna make sure I understand this correctly. Um, the site analysis all happens remotely. So it, it, as in nobody from Cadmus ever comes in and to the sites, which is fine. I just wanna understand and, and if it's how that works. Yeah, so we proposed remote site visit or remote site analysis. Um, so a lot of the work would be done through, um, like we use a, a tool called Heliscope where you can look at 
um, Google Maps or uh, whatever map program and can can estimate like solar hosting capacity based on that and then can look at the utility grid data also remotely. Um, so yeah, we, we've done it pretty successfully in the past and that's how we have it built out uh, for this for this project. Cool. Let us know if it'd be helpful for any of us to run out there and take a photograph or a measurement on site. Uh, many of us could do that easily for you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's good to know, definitely. Yeah. Keep in mind. Great, okay, well, thank you, Eddie and Chad. Um, appreciate you joining. Welcome to stay, but we would understand if you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Great, yeah, right. Thank, our pleasure thanks for having us. Yeah. Uh, excited to work. We're working with all you guys. So, all right. Great. Great Take to care. Have you. Thank you. Yeah, both. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay, great. So, um, Stephanie, back to you for any staff updates. Um, so, I didn't really actually write things down. There's a lot going on, but um, very quickly, I was asked to provide um, the ARPA funding proposal for sustainability. So, I um, can't really give the specifics because they have to be reviewed by the town manager first, but I basically pulled projects from each of the four sectors out of the cap and I utilized um, a lot of the feedback that you all gave um, over time for use of those um, for those funds. So uh, they do cover a project proposed in each sector. Um, so that just went in and I think that just has to be it was really just a sort of rough summary and the town manager will review that and I don't know when I'll get any feedback as to you know how I can move that along further um, but I will certainly let you know um, when I hear anything um, also the uh, CCA effort does continue to move forward we had a meeting today and we just had to get ourselves back around the JPA piece because um, as you all know we had moved to um, utilizing a memorandum of understanding in order to hire the consultant uh, that is being reviewed by legal counsel currently, um, does take a little time, but we're hoping to get uh, their response sooner than later so that we can sign the contract with a consultant. Once that happens, we're going to very quickly want to move the um, joint power agreement into um, the uh, signatory phase so that we can get people's signatures and um, move that effort uh, along as well because the consultant is going to want the joint powers entity to exist when the um, uh, the CCA is sent to the DPU for review. So uh, those things are moving along. I know there's a lot of acronyms and I can catch you up later, but I just don't want to take a lot of time with all of this. So if you have any questions, feel free uh, to reach out to me privately and I'm, I'll happy I'll be happy to to um, give folks an update. And Stella, I just wanted to say, I do have a meeting scheduled with Lori for next week, just to sort of talk about where the committee is. And if you want to schedule some time, I'd be happy uh, to do that. If you want to, if you have any questions or um, information that you want to know, um, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Yeah, that sounds great. That'd be, that'd be really helpful. And I'm sure a lot of this, like, it's already, things are becoming more clear. So, but I appreciate it. Great. <laughs> That's all. I don't really have more right now. Yeah, Steve. Stephanie, do you want to say anything about the latest plans for the solar study and bylaw committee? I, I, um, I saw what went on during the oh, council meeting, so yes. I, I'm kind of aware, but others might be. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. A quick update. Just to, so the town council, um, the town manager presented the uh, proposal for creation of the solar bylaw working group to the town council. And um, so the draft that I sent you was, you know, edited by the town manager. So he changed the structure somewhat. Um, he reduced it instead of a working group that had two subcommittees. He really wants it to be just one working group with seven mm -hmm. members. And five of those members will be from committees. ECAC would have one slot, um, planning board, one planning board member, one board of health member, one conservation commission member, and one uh, member from the water protection supply committee 
or water supply protection committee. I always get that mixed up. Um, so, and then there would be two members from the community that would have expertise in solar and uh, or forestry. So, um, and those two members would have to go through an interview process with the town manager because they wouldn't be um, residents who currently sit on existing committees. So that structure is being presented to the town council. They had an opportunity to um, to hear the proposal and they'll probably weigh in and make changes and eventually they'll uh, hopefully vote on it at their next meeting, I hope, so that it can move forward to create that committee. In the meantime, I will say that um, Duane and I had an initial conversation about the RFP because the funding for the solar assessment is coming from uh, the sustainability funds. Um, I am, at least right now, um, identified as the project manager uh, for working with the with the um, solar bylaw development working group. Um, so I'll be the main staff liaison to that committee. Um, and there will be, I will be getting support from someone from the planning staff, either the planning director herself or someone she appoints from that, um, from that planning department staff to support the work. So it will be moving along. You all will be weighing in. Um, you know, you are identified as uh, certainly being key to helping the, solar, the development of the solar assessment. So, you know, it will be it will be coming before you all for review. Um, and what will probably happen is that your review and feedback will go back to the working group. So they'll be the ones primarily working, you know, they're they're going to be the ones tasked with developing, you know, helping the assessment move along, developing the assessment, having that coincide with development of the bylaw, but there's going to be you know, the sort of side committees that will be feeding this will be the planning board and you all will sort of be the two committees that will review be reviewing this process. And then ultimately the final product product is what will go before the planning board um, and, and the um, town council once they get the bylaw developed. So, um, it, you know, it's probably going to take about a year, really, realistically, it will take a year for this thing to happen. I mean, we can certainly try to make it happen faster, but I would say realistically, it will be a year. If I can add my observation, town council was largely receptive to what Paul had proposed with some great additions by our liaison, Anna, as well as Mandy Joe. Several members of council also expressed they would like to see the study done sooner rather than later. Um, so I think Paul had put in, was it a May 30 date for target completion? And some counselors had asked if it could be completed sooner than that. And he was hesitant at the time because he was worried some of the funding might not be available until after July 1st, but I don't think that turned out to be the case. No, the funding's available for the yeah. for that now. I so it is on a fast track and that, that there may be some tension there between trying to do a thorough job and um, trying to meet the fast track that the council is hoping for. Yeah, Dwayne. Yeah. <laughs> um, and remind me, uh, Stephanie, I think we went over this before, but it may, I, I think helpful for the group as well in terms of the um, finding good candidates for the um, at large com uh, community members that have some expertise in forestry and solar. Um, what would be the method, method by which we might um, make make some suggestions would that be so just an email to you Stephanie or or how would no, that work? No, I, I think people people will have to express their interest to the town manager's office because there is a um I think it's I think they call it the CAF the citizen activity form the okay. same form that you all filled out someone would have to contact I mean what you can do what I would recommend you do is yeah. if there are people that you know you can reach out to them yeah. And you can suggest that they contact the town manager's office if they're interested, but gotcha. they shouldn't necessarily, I mean, they can contact me. I'm just going to direct them to the town manager's office. Okay. So, um, but, but you all are welcome. If there are folks, that you know, that you think would, you know, uh, have the relevant expertise, then yes, please direct them to the town manager's office.
Okay, great. And I think um, I think Anna had to jump, but she did send me a note that I don't think the um, the council's not actually vote. They don't vote on this, right? This is just I think Paul is the ultimate decider, right? So I don't think they're voting on this. Yeah, I think so. I wasn't really clear to me <laughs> what that process between them and Paul is exactly because I understood him to be the one to sort of be able to just move this thing forward, but he took it before the council. So I wasn't sure if they had to vote on a final, on what this finally looks like, or he's just taking their input and guidance on, on um, what that will be is, I guess, the case. Okay. Actually, it does look like Anna's still on. I don't know if she wants to just clarify anything on that. She's in the participants though. Um, I think you have to let her talk, Stephanie. Yep, sorry, I'm just, uh, oh, there we go. Go ahead, Anna. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome, sorry. So um, yeah, we, it's Paul's committee. We don't have a, a vote on it. Uh, he was, I think it was more of a courtesy because of how involved the prior solar project was with council to get our feedback and comments on it. Um, so the poor man was subjected to like 10 of mine and a couple others. And uh, I think he, he heard our comments. He's under no obligation to change the charge because of it, but he, I, I think is very receptive. So it will not be coming before us again. Um, and the message that we, or that I at least was really trying to put out there was like, it, this needs to start yesterday, you know? So um, nothing else, hopefully nothing else will delay it. Um, I have some concerns about that, but that's the message that we tried to send uh, on Monday. And happy to answer other questions if folks have them, but yeah. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna have to duck off now, but y'all are doing a great job. I'll see you <laughs> next meeting. All right, thanks. Um, any other questions for Stephanie? Otherwise we can move on to ECAC member updates. Okay, great. Um, so ECAC member, anybody with ECAC member updates? Also, I kind of rolled in on um, counselor outreach to this. So if you have an update on any counselor outreach you've done since our last meeting, feel free to share that as well. Yeah, Jesse. So I, I've sent a number of emails to my person and I, I wonder if anybody knows them or has a pre-existing relationship that may be that, um, when you see an email from someone you don't recognize and you're a very busy person in these days, I think it's quite understandable not to respond. Um, so I just wonder if anyone might, um, if anyone knew Alicia and could make an introductory email, I would be grateful for that. Okay, great. Yeah, and I think now that we have Anna on board as liaison, we could also utilize her maybe to do an introduction. Um, I could reach out to her directly okay. for that. Yeah, Stella. I think this is jumping back a little bit, but I think I'm, I might have found maybe a partial answer to Dwayne and Steve's question from the presentation in the uh, smart program frequently asked questions. If you just <laughs> Google that, there's like on page four, maybe you're already familiar with this and this wasn't your question, but um, there's a thing about municipal municipal incentives and how that fits in. Great, thanks, Stella. Any other member updates? Yeah, Andra. Yeah, I just wanted to bring um, a, attention to, um, there might be a need for us to educate our um, counselors <laughs> that we're liaison to about the zero energy bylaw. Um, I think there's some confusion about what it's um, actually um, costs and um, you know how it actually saves money in the long run. It's like putting the solar on actually pays for itself over time and, and saves money um, in the long term. So um, there's been some talk about you know our very first building that that we're we're building that we all want to see happen it's going to be really exciting to have our first zero energy building and um there's some uh fear coming up um already about the expense 
And, and so just really want to get it out there that um, actually it's not an expense, it's an investment. So <laughs> that's um, for people to keep their, keep in mind when you're talking to your counselor that um, they may have questions about that. And I was part of the gang of eight that helped renegotiate the original zero energy bylaw um, and then it passed again in 2018. So I know it pretty well. Yeah, Steve, do you have a comment on that? Well, I'm just gonna ask Andre, could you provide us with all of us with some talking points to that effect that would um, give us a little cheat sheet when we're talking to our council representatives? Sure, yeah. Okay. That'd um, be great. I'll, pass, I'll send that to Stephanie to distribute. Yeah, I mean, from following the discussion, it's not really the counselors, it's members of our own community that are raising some of these points. And so I think that our outreach needs to go farther than the counselors. Um, and I think that there's a message to be made about, I mean, I think there's miscommunication I, I think there's miscommunication about net zero in general, right? Like that it's an add on that it's a nice to have and that that's not the case. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, this kind of gets into maybe talking about our retreat and our next steps as a committee, but I feel like there's a lot we could potentially do to help put out some ideally for lack of a better word, bipartisan points about some of this, some of this work. Yeah, Dwayne. Well, I hesitated, but I guess I'll say it. Um, I presume we're talking about the school. <laughs> uh, uh, be, uh, and then, you know, I, I did note, you know, in the reading in the paper, talks about the school and how it's going to be more expensive than one thought. And, and, and the one paragraph on there about why it's more expensive is because of the ground ground source heat pump uh, uh, and so forth. And, and it's like, I think we have to think of two things. One is, yeah, definitely, you know, for a 50 year investment for this town school and we're gonna, then the town is gonna be paying for the, um, uh, the, the heating and electrification of that building for 50 years, that this is a very worthwhile investment. But second, I think we have to be um, cognizant of the, of the, uh, hard place that the town is put in into with regard to yeah it's going to cost a few more millions of dollars uh, and and that has to be budgeted and the the the, the um, state doesn't seem to the the uh, mass school building authority I guess it is doesn't um, uh, account for this type of investment in their capital planning it's it's just uh, you know how much does it cost not how much does it pay back. Uh, and so um, I think we got to sort of, you know, have some sympathy to the town and help, you know, and, 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 and promise that, you know, the ECAC would, would uh, work with the town to try to um, resolve and, and, uh, and justify the additional expense. Yeah. Can, can I even, Andra? <laughs> I had a different update. Okay. So. I'll so Andra and then Steve. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So one of the misconceptions is that the ground source uh, heat pumps are a part of the net zero bylaw requirements. It, it, it's not. That's just the recommendation of the architects and the school building committee can um, say, no, we'd like to have air source heat pumps, which would be cheaper, less efficient, but, you know, cheaper. Um, the only thing that the zero energy bylaw requires is highly efficient envelope, which you know a, a anyone would do nowadays anyway, and um, may, maybe you know a, a, a little more, but but the expense is not significant. And the solar, um, and that does not come anywhere near the ten percent cap. Um, so the the ground source heat pumps should not be counted in as a part of the um, requirements for zero energy. So it really is kind of a straw man. All right, so more to do on communications about all the things. Um, Steve. 
You mentioned, or somebody mentioned outreach, and that reminded me I've been working a little bit to try to develop a community outreach plan and kind of centered on educating residents about the overall goals and, and strategies of the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Action Plan and the 2050 Roadmap. And the, um, one of the great hopes I have is that this new group at UMass, the Energy Transition Institute, which Dwayne is part of, um, would be able to help with that. And I had some great initial conversations with their executive director, Anna Goldstein. Um, and they had a wonderful launch event last week, which was really great, really exciting. Um, but then I just learned yesterday or two days ago that Anna is um, moving on from UMass and um, won't be continuing in that role. So there's a little bit of a void there, but I'm, I'm working, I've connected with a Billy at the Hitchcock Center. What's his last name, Billy? Um, blanking on that. Spitzer. New director of the Hitchcock Right. Spitzer, yeah. yeah. Uh, new director there. And I'm going to meet with him early next week. And he's got a lot of experience with climate change education and, and community outreach. And so my vague idea that I'm exploring of many different people is this, you know, how can we do some kind of a program that helps inform residents more broadly about the need for decarbonization and the strategies that have been developed for doing so. And I think that's really critical because the, when, when you know, we talk about building out solar to meet these goals, the first thing people is, is like, wow, that's a, that's a big change to my environment. I'm not sure I like it. Um, but if they understand that in the context of what we need to do to stop burning fossil fuels and all the negative impacts of burning fossil fuels, I think people will be able to evaluate that and, and um, come to you know, support things differently once they see the bigger picture. So. I'm still working on this. It's it's early, early stages, but um, I hope to hope to create something that will help, and that I think will be help. Um, we'll be looking for help with ECAC as this goes forward. Great, yeah, Andra. <laughs> um, I I just wanted to um, raise again the. Um, Tuesday the 15th, um, and I have sent all of you the um, link to register and learn more. But um, I wanted to ask Stephanie um, if it's gotten onto the website um, or, um, or distributed to staff, because this is going to be a you know, staff member at, in Ithaca speaking. Um, and so I think it might be really interesting for staff. Yeah, I can um, I can certainly send it out to staff. I can I can do that internally, um, but I can ask the communications manager if it's something we could put on the um, on social media. Um, I'll have to ask. I just don't know. Sometimes I'm not sure, like how directly that has to be from the town, you know, like the town um, generated event. So I'll just have to check. But I can certainly share the information with staff. That's an easy thing for me to do. Yeah, Basu. Hey, Steve, can you include me in that conversation you have with Billy next week? Oh, sorry. Your your audio is a little. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. It's a little tinny. Hmm. One more time. No, that's good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Steve, uh, I was just gonna. I was just saying. Can you include me in the conversation that you have with Billy next week? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. I, I can also help you think through what that communication plan needs to look like right or the education series that we were talking about last time yes yes that was my thinking too you, you've okay. done some work on that and we need to, to, to pull these threads together thank you yes yeah, Stella Andrew just with respect to the communications for the event on the 15th I've gotten it from at least two different mailing lists and one personal email uh, apart from this committee so it's definitely like getting out there <laughs> 
<laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, okay, with that, I think we can, I think that's a pretty good transition into the next agenda item, which is really just um, following up on some discussions we had last time about how do we move forward on, how do we strategically move forward on some of the projects? How do we um, sort of fold in our new members? Um, you know, Don and Vasu both joined in January, is that right? No, when did you guys join? September? I don't know, October. I can't remember I either. It was either September or October, I think. Right? Okay, not January, but not that long ago. October. Um, yeah. Okay. And the rest of us are, are going on our third, are almost at three years, which is also kind of hard to believe. Um, so it just feels like a really good time to, um, we've tried this a couple times, but because of the flux of the group, I think we haven't really, it hasn't really stuck in terms of kind of organizing us around projects and really making sure we're, we're moving forward. And I, I think now is the right time to do that. Um, so something I threw out last week was the idea of a retreat. Um, and so I threw together right before this meeting and I apologize for doing it so late. Um, basically just kind of some notes from that discussion and uh, some thoughts on how it might work. And I'd love to get, um, get feedback on this and see how folks, what folks think. Um, so the first is just what the goal of the retreat would be. It would be to get to know our new members. We, we could invite Anna um, and really develop our work strategies around our key projects and activities. Some of which we know, um, you know, the building electrification work, the CCA work, the solar work, the communications work. Some of which we may, you know, with Stella, with your expertise, we may have other things we want to we want to bring into this. Um, and then develop strategies around how to ensure our com our committee is being utilized to the best of its ability. You know, really, you know, I think we're a resource for the town. Um, you know, are we are we doing that well? Is that is that clear? Is there ways we can make that more clear? Um, so I thought that given that we all don't have a ton of time, um, I thought maybe one thing we could do is do it sort of in a couple couple sessions. So our, having our next ECAC meeting really be a bit, a bit about level setting and prep. So Steve has um, been thinking about sort of the organizational structure of, of ECAC as the, you know, how, how when we did the CARP, for those that were on the group then, when we wrote the CARP and when Jesse wrote the CARP letter, he's kind of identified five key areas that ECAC was gonna work. And we started, I think, last summer to try to organize ourselves around those five key areas. So Steve started thinking a little bit about bringing that back um, so we can sort of talk, you know, level set on that. We could level set on a couple of our key initiatives. Like I'd love to get, um, we've been talking quite a bit about renewable energy because of all the solar discussions, but I'd love to get an update on CCA, get an update on the building electrification um, projects. Um, and so we can maybe spend a chunk of our meeting next time, sort of getting those, get, getting those overviews and starting our brain thinking about um, where we wanna take these. And then when we have the retreat, we can really focus on strategies around each of those. So I think what we've talked about is terms of what ECAC's sweet spot is, is really educational outreach, identifying the policy levers that we need to be helping to develop or helping to push doing any research needs or helping to lead research on any needs, or questions that folks have and identifying partnerships for key projects. Um, so, so we can spend, you know, a good chunk of our retreat really develop, like laying out, what do we need to do to make these things move forward? And who do we need to partner with? You know, what's our timeline? What, what do we need? Um, and really identify who's going to lead on some of these things so we don't overburden ourselves with too many things at once. 
Um, and then the weekend, the meeting following that, we can kind of review the outcomes and then go back to the organizational structure and make sure we've, um, you know, we kind of have a clear picture moving forward with ECAC. I won't be present on the meeting on the 20th, although that might not be bad because I certainly um, do not think I will be continuing as chair <laughs> past this year. I think I, my chairness has, um, I've really enjoyed being chair, but I hope in June we can identify maybe a new chair from the group. So um, I haven't decided if I'm gonna stay on ECAC, but I might stay on ECAC, but I don't think I wanna be chair after June. So um, it may be good to have someone else lead that discussion, who knows, um, if we wanna meet on the 20th. But um, I think that this could be like a good kind of refresh, restart, of the group with our new members and our plan done and ready to implement. Um, so would love to get people's thoughts on whether this makes sense, whether it be things people want to see. Yeah, Stephanie. Sorry, this is just a housekeeping thing in terms of having the retreat. Um, I know that the council just had one in person, but I but they are meeting in person and we still have the remote policy, meeting policy. So we may, we definitely have to advertise it, just so you know, um, mm -hmm. and it may have to happen on Zoom because of the timing versus uh, being in person. I just wanted to put that out there. Okay. Yeah, that's why I kind of flagged already allowed to do it in person. Maybe, Stephanie, if you could look into that for us a little bit more and let us know. Any other que thoughts or questions, things that might be missing? Do folks have a preference about when to do it? I know it's hard to give up weekend time for this stuff, but it's also hard to give up time. Like, <laughs> I mean, we could do it for the two hours that we normally have ECAC, you know, I don't know what folks, I guess it de also depends on if we wanna meet, if we can meet in person. So maybe Stephanie, if you can find that out and then we can sort of maybe do a doodle poll of like, during our regular ECAC time, an extended ECAC time, it would be hard for me to start any earlier than four um, just because of work, but, um, or weekend. Yeah. Another possibility if we can't be in person and, um, you know, just an extended time is hard to do on Zoom. Um, we could add a meeting on the off week and continue the retreat. So be another way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stella. I would prefer not to do it in person if possible, at least until the like two to five year olds can be vaccinated, which doesn't unfortunately seem soon. Um, I would be happy to do outside, but I don't know if like in the next month, if that's too uh, cold still for people uh, and just like weekends, definitely I'd, I'd be happy to do, um, but kind of back on the small child thing, anytime after like 6.30 or so uh, gets into like bedtime territory. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, thank you, Stella. Okay, so we'll think a little bit about how to work this out in terms of, um, yeah, we could get really lucky with a nice day in April, but we probably can't count on that. Um, any, uh, any thoughts on things that might be missing or anything missing from the level setting discussion? I, I, I was trying to make sure I captured everything, but um, I know Steve, you had mentioned, oh yeah, Jesse, go ahead. What, can you tell me what level setting means? Oh my gosh, and corporate speak is coming out. Like just bringing everybody up to the same page. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. I, I probably- A level, it. that's an architecture thing, right? Like <clears throat> you make a picture no, no, level. No, no, no we, we, it's all these, everything's <laughs> askew these days and very, um, <laughs> So it me, it's like um, bringing us all up to speed, getting everyone on the same page. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'll, I'll be using that. 
<laughs> you're, you're so old school, Jesse. Yeah, get get on the level here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the three main things um, that we would focus on at the next meeting would are um, Steve's proposal for structure work groups, um, key initiatives that include the um, renewable energy, solar, CCA, and building electrification, the rental properties initiative. Um, so I'm just trying to think, are there other things that should be, you know, like if we hadn't lost track of it, should have been a work group that we did get a start on? Yeah, Stephanie, did you have a... Uh, yes, to add CPACE, outreach for CPACE. Yeah, I was there. trying to decide if that was like, a, yeah, we should put that in there, what CPACE is. And, um, I, yeah, <laughs> it should definitely be in there. I mean, may, maybe it ends up being part of um, the um, retreat itself, but I, th I feel like we should have an open Q&A about the CARP. For all of us, <laughs> but particularly for newer people. Yeah, I was thinking about putting that on there, like maybe having Stephanie do a five minute overview of the key outcomes of the the key, like, you know, the roadmap, <laughs> put the roadmap up and maybe talk through anything that's you know is is already working its way through the town versus things that seem like they don't have coverage. Uh, and is this, is sorry, is this for next meeting or for the retreat? Next meeting? Yeah, let's do it next meeting. So we kind of do all the info sessions at the next meeting and then we can spend the retreat time really. Um, and so in terms of, I think, for those of you that are doing an update on this, you know, I think it'd just be helpful to overview, like, what is it? <laughs> what, what, the, what is the current process? And like, what are, the, what are the things that you hope to happen with this in the next one to two years, right? So we kind of have a sense of where it, it needs to go. Um, the only other thing I think of that, um... I'd like to level set, <laughs> you know, we had this experience of some significant outreach to um, community members who aren't, aren't often included in um, things at this, you know, level of development um, in, in putting together the CARP and maybe just sharing um, some things about that process and how we, how much we thought about um, environmental justice and um, inclusiveness. Yeah, that's a great idea. And Stephanie, I think would be best suited to do that as well in part as part of the CARP. Um, does that work for you, Stephanie? Sorry, I'm putting stuff on your plate. <laughs> that's really okay. So you want me to, I mean, you just want me to do a five minute overview of the CARP. I mean, that, that to me is like, how it gets launched really because that was the foundation of starting the whole process so mm -hmm. yeah that yeah. would be included great good suggestion andra um vasu yeah i was thinking you know we have all these action items in, in the carp that we want to take and those are the ones that will filter out in the agenda for discussion i just wonder if there's things that we need to think about about our process, not actions, but what are we good at and what are we bad at as a group and discuss that as a team. And maybe it's our structure that we need to change. I think that should be discussed as well. Yeah, totally. And that's what I was thinking the retreat would really focus on is like, what are, um, and yeah, I mean, I've identified just based on our previous discussions, these three general buckets of educational outreach policy levers and research needs but there could be more and you're exactly right I think we should identify 
because ultimately we need, I mean, this, we're all volunteering our time here. Right. And, you know, we want to be doing things that act that we're interested in and excite us so that we find the time in our otherwise really busy schedules to do, do this work. So um, that should also be a really important consideration. Like, what do we actually want to do? Like I find for personally for myself, like leading educational outreach sort of feels like it's not in my wheelhouse. So like, what could I do? What could I bring to the, to the group? where other people may find that that's exactly what they want to do, right? So that's a really good point. Yeah, and I also wonder, you know, the week, the um, meeting next week about uh, from the, uh, uh, the Ithaca um, city, uh, maybe there's opportunity to talk about their governance and how they're managing their actions too. There might be some questions that we can ask them and learn from them. Yeah, I, I agree. It would be, um, yeah, we should keep that in mind as well. Is that going to be recorded, um, Andra, do you know? Yeah, it will be recorded. And that, that'll be on the um, Local Energy Advocates website. Great. Yeah, Jesse. At, at the risk of continuing the conversation now and not later, I, I feel like Masu's premise also needs to include the conversation about the kind of inherent challenges of working um, in the context of, maybe this is just also obvious, but I feel like it's not just what we're excited about and what we're good at and bad at. It's like, there is a pretty intense state legal system that mandates how we are allowed to do this work right now. Mm -hmm. I'm just like brainstorming how to how to work best within that those constraints, and so I'm just kind of planting that seed before the conversation. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I've been taking some notes and I'll recirculate this um, to everybody. Um, I think the main thing we need to nail down is sort of what we wanna do for the next meeting. And I think we've, we've highlighted that, so that's great. And then we can continue to iterate a bit on the schedule for the retreat. Um, and maybe we break it into two different meetings or, or if we can't, find it because I agree with Andra more than two hours on zoom is too much so um we'll figure out how we can do it in a way that um feels productive any last thoughts or questions on this I think the other agenda item let's see sorry I lost the agenda here um so future items updates on ongoing projects retreat discuss the future projects items for next meeting agenda okay i think we covered most of that is there anything anybody wants to raise um that we didn't cover Okay. Oh yeah, that's too. Yeah, Laura, I know we were supposed to talk about the timeline. Um, we'll have to find some time to talk about it. So. Yeah, and we can talk about, maybe we can find some time to talk about it and how we could fit it into this schedule because it feels like um, that could be something, you know, after the retreat, we really nailed down that timeline. It seems like the right timing. Yeah. Timing yeah, I was just going to bring that up now that if the retreat's planned for the next meeting or the week after, I think we should wait. Okay. Great. Um, okay, well, then I will see if there's any public comment. Is there any public still here? It's like Kathleen has her hand raised. Yep. Kathleen, go ahead. You're allowed to speak now. Thank you so much. Um, it's really impressive to see you all working on these issues. I have a, a simple question. Uh, how does a retreat 
fit into the context of open meeting laws. Could you please explain that so that those of us who are very interested in what this process is can actually continue to watch it going on? Thank you. Bye. Yeah, great question. I'll turn over to Stephanie. Yeah, the um, yeah the committees are public bodies, so whenever a quorum um, is assembled, uh, meaning in this case uh, there are are we up to nine members now? <laughs> we have nine members, um, so we have a quorum of five members. So if five or more members meet, it has to uh, be open to the public. So if they have a retreat, um, it has to get posted. Uh, if the members are all present. So that does mean the public, um, it has to be available if public wants to attend. Typically retreats, the agendas are posted. Um, I think usually with re retreats, there's kind of an understanding that it's an opportunity for the group to, to delve deeper. I know in some cases, some retreats, um, people actually share personal information as part of a bonding experience. So, um, but it's still, it's sort of understood that it's still an, an open public um, gathering. So either if it's a retreat that's in person, it means it's going to be posted. So you'll know where they're going to meet and the time that they're going to meet. Um, and then if it's not, it will be a Zoom meeting. So it will be like this and it will be posted as they usually are. Um, you know, even the retreat will be posted in the same manner. So it will be on the town's website in the calendar section. Um, and uh, it will be, you know, we'll post the uh, agenda as we always do on the ECAC website as well. Yeah, great. Thanks, Stephanie. And thanks for the question, Kathleen. I think yeah, we probably like wouldn't necessarily, do we have to do public comment during retreats, Stephanie, or? No, I don't think you do actually. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you don't. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're sort of just using retreat as a fancy word to say we're gonna like, Think harder about stuff and try to try to organize ourselves. <laughs> That's a euphemism for a long meeting. Yeah, <laughs> sounds it sounds nicer. If we are in person, Stephanie will bring us food. <laughs> she'll she'll sing for us. Yes. That. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, I think then we can go ahead and call it for tonight. Thank you guys for another um, good meeting and um, we'll be in touch in a few weeks. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Thank all. You. Thank you.